So good morning, friends, ladies and gentlemen, fellow surgeons. It's a pleasure to be uh, associated with the Lucknow College of Surgeons, and I thank the, the Lucknow College of Surgeons uh, uh, for giving me this opportunity to be a part of the celebrations of this excellent conference. Uh, to deliver the very prestigious Professor Katie Verma oration, for me, on a personal note, it's a personal honor. A, a word about Professor Katie Verma, whom a person, an iconic person, as far as the, the college, the university is concerned, um, a, a man who gave his life to the Department of Surgery of this college, and with his huge accomplishments. The, um, and besides, of course, as, as many of us know, he uh, went on to do his FRCS from Glasgow. And most, and another very interesting fact was of him was his training in West Germany, where he um, um, learned some nuances of nuclear medicine. And when he came back, he set up this nuclear medicine laboratory, the Department of Surgery in 1975. And, and he used this lab to perform iodine-131 thyroid scans, and even for um, use um, various renal flow studies like DTPA and BMSA scans um, as uh, early as the 1980s. But what happened was that with his retirement in 2000, this lab subsequently closed, and because KGMU at that point of time, and, and for many years thereafter, has not had nuclear medicine degree holders in this university. But that said, he was the first head of the Department of General Surgery after CTVS, Urology, Pediatric Surgery and Surgical Oncology separated in 1998. Well, um, friends, Professor K.D. Verma was a surgical giant. He did whatever he could and he, and he made a huge, huge difference as far as the department is concerned. We wish him health. He is, uh, at the moment, continues to be in practice in Lucknow and continues to contribute to the society at large. Well, uh, coming to the topic for today's oration, I have selected this topic because um, Artificial intelligence has engulfed our lives in diverse spectra, be it um, art, manufacturing, finance, drug manufacturing, military research, marketing, transportation, entertainment, and continues to be knocking on the doorsteps of medicine. It is, I can, I can tell you for certain that it is threatening to inundate our practice of medicine. It is in this context that we as surgeons require to understand its implication and um, embrace this new technology to our advantage. I need to talk about various diverse spectra of intelligence in surgery would include, and that would be diagnostics, imaging, surgical navigation, and perhaps robotic surgery. Let's go through just a brief review about how medical technology has overwhelmed the, the medical fraternity. If you look at the last about five decades, you, you can see in, in every decade has had a few path-breaking discoveries. 50s saw the artery kidney, the, the cardiac pacemaker, 60s saw the ultrasound, 70s. So, saw the CT scan, 80s, saw the, the MRI, laser surgery, and then from the um, subsequent decades of drug advancements, biologics, targeted therapy, PET scans, 3, 3D and 4D ultrasounds. And in the last few years, I've seen an, an artificial heart, bioartificial livers, camera pills, bionic contact lenses. And today we have the genomic sequencing and microarrays, PET scans, image-guided surgery, and AI, 
continues to make deep inroads in the practice of surgery. So what exactly is artificial intelligence and what exactly, how does it impact us? It is a use of computer to model intelligent behavior with min minimal human intervention. Machines and computer programs are capable of problem solving and learning. Here is the intelligent Mr. Robo who can solve complex problems. He can do decision-making. He has increased accuracy. He can perform high-level computations. All of this, all these textbooks that you see, all of this he has absorbed by his machine learning and deep learning. And he has all of this available at the fraction of a second. Friends, ladies and gentlemen, there has been a rise of AI in surgery, in medicine at large, surgery in particular today. Increasing use for risk stratification, genomics, imaging and diagnosis, precision medicine, I'll, I'll be speaking more about this, and drug discovery. Now these are some areas where it has have immense importance, where uh, as, as clinicians, as surgeons, we would find that AI continues to um, um, uh, have an increasing impact as far as management protocols are concerned. Its introduction into surgery recently has resulted in the, the, the Da Vinci machine, the robots, the so-called robotic surgery, and what we are now used to hearing and seeing, wherein there is imaging and navigation has become a very, uh, what was earlier a very complex um, technological advancement is now become a very easy way of understanding the imaging and navs doing surgical navigation. Earlier techniques of focusing on feature detection and computer assistant intervention has become so simple with so simple with the uh, uh, the beautiful complex spatial images being synergized, coordinated, and then uh, uh, brought out as a delivery, which, which is easily understandable and um, a playable. Now, if you look at the various components, it includes a virtual branch and a physical branch. So we talk about initially what is the virtual branch, and that is actually machine learning, teaching the machine with huge amount of data. And the data, as, as, you, as you can see, it, uh, it, uh, it uses statistical methods for machines to improve their experiences over a period of time. As you keep increasing the, the amount of data, the machine classifies the data. And what is called as deep learning is where uh, there is a subs subset of machine learning, which makes the competition of this artificial neural network actually um, um, allows it to become feasible. It is designed to simulate the way the human brain analyzes and processes information. Artificial intelligence in medicine, the virtual branch. Now, as far as the, the virtual branch actually in, um, uh, is one of the most exciting areas for the development of computational approaches to automatically make sense of the data. Problem is, when there is huge amount of data, how do you analyze it? How do you classify it? How do you segment it and make it understandable and um, uh, for easy understanding and um, um, making use of that information. So it, the advantages of machine learning include retaining information, becoming smarter over time. Machine is not, not susceptible to sleep deprivation, distractions, information overload, and short-term memory loss. Benefits of artificial intelligence, I'll suffice. You can, as you can see, there are huge amount of benefits. Uh, clinical decision-making becomes better, replace replaces human judgment in certain functional areas of healthcare, example, radiology. It means so you just show the, the X-ray chest and it tells you whether it's COVID positive or otherwise, up-to-date medical information from journals, textbooks, and clinical practices. It summates and accumulates so much information from so many journals and gives you a contemporary a piece of information, which is uh, as, of, as of now, as of today, 
and experienced versus fresh clinicians. The problem is fresh clinicians may not be up to date. And here it is. Here is a situation where AI is available to the fresh clinician and he is up to date. He knows exactly what is happening. 24-7 availability of an expert with, with AI at your help. And early diagnosis, prediction of outcome of disease, as well as treatment, feedback on treatment, and reinforce non-pharmacological management protocols, reducing diagnostic and therapeutic errors, and increasing patient safety, and huge cost savings associated with the use of AI. Now, these are some of the diverse spectrum of benefits of AI in clinical practice. Well, um, um, the physical branch includes the physical objects, the medical devices, which are used and integrated with the, the, the data processing systems, which help in the collection of data from the individual, from the, uh, the patient, from the clientele, and picks it up and passes it on to the um, um, intelligent computer. And, and these sophisticated robots are what we call as um, uh, care, uh, care robots or robots for surgery. So uh, uh, we'll, we'll uh, talk about these. As you can see here, these are robots to deliver treatment. This is, of course, the Da Vinci and, uh, and the, uh, the surgeon there or the console and uh, doing the operative work with, with his um, manual skills. And uh, here are uh, the use of robots to monitor effectiveness of treatment. You're all aware of uh, what uh, happened in the Cleveland Clinic in the US where IBM um, uh, mon uh, monitored and discovered this, this app which monitors care giving to all patients who come to the Cleveland Clinic. Similarly, in the UK under the NHS, Google DeepMind has now produced a, um, a app which also monitors treatment protocols which come for patients who come to the NHS for treatment. Now, a word about AI in surgery, pre-op, whether it's pre-op operative guidance, which, which is essential for the success of surgery, whether it is intraoperative planning, which is for so the surgical navigation, tissue track, tracking for biopsy, for biopsies, but even just for the movement, the dynamics of the of the scopes in, while inside while inside the tissue, and lastly, of course, this is a surgical robots for precision surgery. AI for preoperative planning. A, a word about what what is. How does, how does one go about, well, how does the robot perceive the information, the data, the images, the graphics, the images from the patient, let's say, um, whether it's from a pathology slide, uh, uh, they are um, um, taken in by the, the computer, the, it, the images are processed, uh, and they are compared with the their input variable, in a by which is a repository of pre-processed histopathology images, and the diagnosis is reached by the transfer of the learning neural network, which when it gives out a prediction of what is a possible diagnosis. So, so there it is, an input, uh, an input here where it looks at the possible diagnosis. Here is the image being processed. And then after processing the final product of what could possibly be the diagnosis, and that is the output um, where it classifies and does a possible prediction. And how it does goes about the processes by a summation, a collation of all of these images. It's broken down into small segments. They classify it into a possible pattern based on data recognition from the pre-processed repository of images, and then get up coming to a possible diagnosis and suggesting a possible diagnosis. Now, if you look at detection, what it effectively means is that there is a spatial localization of the regions of interest in the form of 
bounding boxes and landmarks. Now have a look at this. This is a, a, a CT scan where it a CT scan which sees that there is possible a, a problem, but by AI is documenting now that this is and is showing by a red box is telling you that possibly this is an area of disease, of a possible area of fibrosis, a, a disease area which requires further evaluation. So detecting various anomalies medical conditions by, uh, by a spatial localization of the region of interest. Segmentation. Now this is, a, 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 as you can see this, a, a densely packed image, thoroughly screened, and the data is collated into through the, the, the deep convolutional neural network, better image and understanding. Okay, now that's the region, and the region is being evaluated in different um, uh, at different levels, and there is a 3D construction of the region to be done. So the images were picked up on a routine CT scan or the MRI, but collation and summation of these images resulted in a 3D reconstruction for a better understanding of the disease. If you look at registration, I, I talked about the terminology of registration, which effectively means that the raw medical images are combined, collated, and integrated to, to produce an optimal image. What it actually means is lots of images like these uh, go through a process to take out a final image, which, which is um, the best possible uh, image that you can get out in, by this process of registration that is the, going to be the sample which is going to be projected for a possible diagnosis. And, and that uh, uh, is then compared with the repository of images in, in, in the uh, AI repository and for a better diagnosis. Now this is particularly important for both pre and intraoperative planning. Now, talking about intraoperative guidance, which continues to be one of the most critical uh, aspects for AI. Now, it includes a couple of very important um, 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 topics, which include a 3D shape inst instantation, which is for intraoperative 3D reconstruction. 3D volumes can be scanned with MR, CT, and ultrasound. So a summation of all of these images gives you a 3D shape for as far as the region is concerned, which helps you to understand, which helps to understand and plan your intraoperative uh, procedure. Endoscopic navigation is yet another, a very critical step where the camera depth estimation, the visual odometry odomet and 3D reconstruction and localization, because these are dynamic images, because as you move your scope inside the tissue, it requires a huge amount of estimation, uh, the proprioception, the visual impact, with, and, and the spatial alignment of the camera and the lesion and the normal tissue requires a huge amount of uh, understanding. And therefore, this, uh, um, um, these, um, the various techniques that we talked about, whether it is uh, uh, registration, segmentation, and, and, and perception, all of them have to be collated to find, make, make it a more useful information. Tissue feature track, tracking for retargeting a pre-selected -select, optical biopsy region on soft tissue surfaces of the GI tract confuse us yet again. So this, uh, how to track the area, how to track the, the area of interest is yet again because it's pre-selected and we will show you some pictures, some videos, how to proceed for tissue feature tracking. Augmented reality is yet again um, 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 an art uh, where the, the picture, the picture gets enhanced. It's an augmented uh, uh, picture um, available only to the surgeon, whether it is because with manual skills, 
with um, uh, hand skills, or it is by movement of fingers, by facial expression, by eye movements. Now the computers are so guided by all of these movements that results in an augmented reality and uh, in, in the area of interest. So let's talk and take you through some of these uh, uh, terminologies that we talked about. The first video, um, now this is showing 3D instant reconstruction of a spine, a spine model using ultrasound imaging. It's showing a 3D reconstruction of an ultrasound picture. And if you notice here, it is it's going to give you a 3D reconstruction of the spinal lesion. Let's talk of the endoscopic biopsy system. This is an endoscopic navigation, and a system using AI-driven robotic arm with a surgeon performing a robotic with a robotic hand console. The software creates a 3D image of the respiratory tree to guide the surgeon. This is um, uh, like an endoscopic biopsy using the CT scan. Now look at the um, the scope coming in to the the. Um, the tracheobronchial tree, stopping at the interface. The, um, you, the, he's, the surgeon is seeing, seeing uh, uh, the endoscopic uh, picture, but he can also see what is happening. Um, 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 uh, where is he on a larger scale, where as far as the whole lung is concerned? So, and this is how he is controlling with his manual um, controls, he is controlling the scopes and uh, moving towards the lesion. And um, now look at this endoscopic navigation as he walks his way to the lesion. He walks his way to the lesion, seeing a, a 3D spatial picture of precise localization of the lesion and then going ahead and doing the biopsy. Whereas uh, augmented reality is, uh, uh, as I mentioned, is uh, yet again um, enhanced the lens of the real physical world. Completely different experience. Use of a working domain, which is really tailored around the needs of the physician. Sound or other sensations are delivered by technology. Screen to the other, really how, rapidly. If we can now get the this screen to come in just by voice recognition, by fingers. eye tracking. This is all about efficiency. If patients are being treated and the procedure can be shortened, it's very so beneficial for the eyes. We can move um, the sensors, move and track and do this navigation. And as um, uh, by, just by um, uh, uh, these various sensory devices, which helps result in an augmented reality in the, in the digital world. Innovative. Well, friends, AI, uh, for as far as surgical robotics is concerned, is a different ballgame. It helps to boost the capability of the robotic system. The, uh, the, uh, the images, the complex images, the complex um, inputs that we get, it results in perceiving complex in vivo environments, conducting decision-making and performing the desired tasks with increased precision, safety, and efficiency. Now, the common AI techniques used for robotic autonomous system include perception, localization, and mapping, system modeling and control, and the human robo interaction. Now, these are some of the languages which um, are uh, utilized by the, uh, the, the robotic system. And I'm not going to go into the details of these various languages, but I'll suffice it to say that with its system modeling and control, with its the human robo interface, whether it is perception, localization, and mapping, this is a sum. The whole story is a summation of each and every one of these individual um, um, requirements, individual techniques, and a summation of this results 
an effective response by the robo. Now, just take you through what they all actually mean. Perception is the instrument segmentation and tracking interaction between surgical tools and the environment. Example, the tool tissue interaction during surgery in suturing. Now that's really a perception because normally in, in laparoscopy, you'll find that the, uh, there is always a, a, a small gap as far as the under central, you get a hang of it in the hand-eye coordination. Here, the perception, because it is a 3D perception is, is much simpler. The system modeling and control is learning from human demonstrations. The machine learns from various human demonstrations and the, and the, um, uh, the repeated learning by human demonstrations results in a repository of images of data for the machine and over a period of time with, with machine learning, with deep learning, it learns exactly how and what the the, uh, the uh, human demonstration, the human uh, um, uh, endeavor must ensure. Now, learning from these demonstrations also is known as programming by demonstration or imitation learning is a popular paradigm for enabling robots to perform autonomously new tasks with learned policies. The common framework per segment is a complicated surgical task into se several motion prim primitives or subtasks followed by recognition, modeling, and execution of the subtasks sequentially. Coming to the reinforcement learning, which is where robots learn novel behaviors through trial and error interactions. This burdens the human operator from having to pre-program accurate behaviors. And this is particularly important as we deploy robots in scenarios where the environment actually may not be known. A word about perception, uh, instrument segmentation and tracking. Now, um, I'll, uh, here is a video which, which shows how the, the robo is actually taught, is taught the concept of the um, uh, segmentation of the image over a period of time and helps you to track uh, the, the, the instruments, track those um, uh, uh, segmented images in a three-dimensional spatial environment and try and move and do the task what is, it has been. If you talk about imitation learning and learning from human demonstrations, uh, this is um, uh, yet another, as I, I, as I said, conditioned imitation learning, learning from manipulation tasks. The various tasks, scenario like this, the machine, the, human could the robo is taught. Pick up look at this now. Here green. is pick up Model the light. Green from vision and language is used to generate remote control policies. In particular, it, perception now is, it is for the machine to recognize information about the the recognize the green, the green cup. Is then applied on the robot. There it is. Pick up the light green cup. There it is. Pick it up. And then, and then fill all of it into the large blue bowl. And there it is. And here the machine is understanding how it is the blue bowl and, and, uh, and responds to the direction. Here, uh, this is an example of learning from human demonstration. The human robo interaction is a yet another dimension which allows surgeons to control and cooperate with a surgical robo system with touchless manipulation. It is a field that integrates knowledge, techniques from multiple disciplines to build effective communication between humans and the robots. Uh, interaction media between surgeons and intelligent robots are usually through surgeons' gaze, head movements, speech voice, and hand gestures, which I showed you a short while ago. Now, um, let's talk about what does this entire process include? Uh, I'm talking of robotic surgery. So there is a pre-operative planning, there is intra-operative guidance, this, the surgical robo itself, and 
are there ethical and legal issues? So more public available large scale data sets for training of deep convoluted neural networks um, is con continues to be the single most important um, data set which is most important for understanding, for making a huge repository. Not only making a repository, but keep updating this repository. A, fed a federated learning, meta learning, and explainable AI, and early detection and diagnosis based on multimodal information actually helps in a preoperative understanding of the image and planning um, uh, the surgical treatment. The surgical ro robo, um, what one envisages and endeavors that it, it is more versatile. It is lighter and it's cheaper in cost. Increasing level of robotic autonomy with the uh, learning from demos and reinforced reinforcement learning continue to be of increasing importance. Nano robots for diagnosis and drug delivery are, are unique examples of precision medicine, some pictures of which I will be showing you in the next few minutes. Um, Intraoperative guidance includes shift from static images uh, displays to show dynamic organ function, advanced um, uh, augmented reality and virtual reality technologies for surgical training and teaching. Remote surgical cooperation between multidisciplinary teams. Now these are some of the uh, critical steps as far as surgical navigation is concerned and continue to be um, of prime importance as far as the, the ro robotic arm is concerned. Ethical and legal issues include the, to protect the privacy of the patient's data, cyber crime, which has become increasingly important, and, um, um, and it supports systems when failures happen in AI. There would be failures, there would be problems, there would be complications, and uh, 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 we, we require some support systems when we fail in, the, in our procedures. Ethics, trust between the patients and the AI systems. The AI systems are evolving, they continue to improve. So there has to be some trust between the, uh, the machine and the humans. And I think that exactly is what we are talking about. Um, uh, just a few pictures about nano robots wading through the blood to deliver the drug. Now this is an example of precision medicine where the, the drug delivery is given in exacting places by a nano robot. And similarly here is a DNA robot targeting cancer. Now this is really what we are talking about, those biologics that we talk about and um, uh, which is, have become um, um, a standard of care, so to say, in, in medical oncology. A word about the future of surgery. Friends, this is how number eight innovation in robotic surgery. Best as all the extension of the physician's hands. We are robotic surgery provides stand on the threshold and we can get in the field and allow the development of more accurate uh, planning tools and uh, software to increase AI, automation of tasks to building and, and, and uh, overtaking and inundating for proper instrument positioning even implantation in, during uh, spinal surgery increase time. surgeon precision automating the bronchoscopy process avoids incisions with the insertion of flexible tubes through the body's natural openings using a controller like interface this advancement increases accuracy and safety while decreasing invasiveness and cost Robotization is also reaching endovascular procedures like percutaneous coronary intervention, PCI, and peripheral vascular intervention, PVI, which traditionally require the surgeon to wear lead. Using robotics now lowers risk for patients and the surgeon while improving outcomes. Robotic surgery provides precision, flexibility, and control. Paired with shortened recovery time and limited pain, Patients benefit from the continued advancements in the field. Yes, that's what it is. Uh, um, uh, the future of surgery continues with the with technology, with technology taking it to a, giving it a different dimension. Growth drivers of AI in healthcare include 
increasing individual healthcare expenses, larger geriatric population can, uh, um, can be given the expertise of, um, of healthcare with um, various dimensions, with various um, features of AI, which helps the geriatric population. And there, there is an imbalance between the health workforce and the patients, which is normally there even in developed countries where there is a, 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 a demand supply mismatch, much more in developing countries like ours. In, and it is here that AI in healthcare can be a huge fillet and help in decreasing this demand supply issues, increasing global healthcare expenditure, which is, um, um, which is perhaps uh, would become um, a necessity because if, um, at least today, the economics of uh, um, AI continue to be extreme um, um, uh, on the other extreme, and therefore there would be it would take some time for the costs and the econ and the economics to come down. Continuous shortage of nursing and te technician staff is really the the driver for in increasing use of AI in healthcare. Now. What are the potential challenges? Uh, challenges include costs, as I said, integration issues, ethical issues, reluctance among medical practitioners to adopt AI and fear that the machine would overtake humans in the times to come. Data privacy and security continues to be of importance because there is a possible of data theft. Mobile health application devices that use AI can transfer images and graphics and information Data exchange need for continuous training of data from clinical studies. All the parties in the healthcare system, physicians, uh, pharmaceutical companies, and the patients have greater incentives to compile and exchange information. State and federal regulations, rapid and iterative process of software updates, commonly used to improve existing products and services. Now, that's another issue which I mentioned that. The, the, the data repository requires to be replaced from time to time and to be updated to make it more a contemporary and understanding as far as uh, the information is concerned. So let's look at the future Indian scenario. Let me begin with by saying that there has been a collaboration between medical and technical institutions um, uh, in and um, around Lucknow um, as far as KGNU is concerned. We are teaming up with others, many, including the IITs. Uh, I sincerely believe that we should not work in silos. We have to break these silos. We have to walk across and do a handshake with technology. Guidelines for IPR are an absolute must. Government funding, with, with, which is more intelligent, and, and, the, and the funding which ensures that whatever we do, whatever research, whatever interaction, whatever, whatever our, is our collaboration, should be much more result-oriented and have a tran uh, translational research um, uh, um, uh, benefits, I, I think are going to be um, absolutely mandatory. Uh, you, um, uh, the concept of you pat my back and I pat yours is really uh, not going to really work out in, in the longer term. And I think there's a need for us to introspect on, on that point. The data needs to be captured in real time. Institutions should promote their transformation into intelligible processes. I think uh, um, I cannot uh, uh, um, emphasize on this more that data capturing continues to be the real, the real process. And updating the, uh, the data from time to time is going to be really the, the watchword in times to come. Integration and interoperability, including ethical, legal, logistical concerns are of huge importance. Simplification, readability, and clinical utility of data sets, which includes uh, uh, answering of questions for its clinical applicability, the aim of increasing the clinical value and decreasing health costs. Now, those are the questions in, on a larger uh, page that you will require to answer and uh, maintenance of electronic and medical health records are essential tools 
for personalized medicine. And these um, are becoming so much more important as um, healthcare um, in India continues to improve and look up. And um, uh, we, friends, ladies and gentlemen, as we continue to embrace technology, I think there is a need for us to understand that unless until we, continue, we are contemporary, we understand the state of art, we understand what the West is doing, whether we can actually pick it up in good time and get onto the bandwagon if we have to um, uh, take full use of this huge ex technic medical technical explosion, so to say, which is happening in the present decade, it's time for us to embrace artificial intelligence in medicine at large, in surgery in particular. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and I thank you for your attention.